Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the garden question and answer video that I do most Sundays. If you have a gardening question, you can ask it down in the comments below. Your comment is your question. So uh, ask away. I pick from the questions from the previous week, uh, each week, and uh, uh, I try to pick ones that are kind of relevant to whatever's going on, you know, at that time or ones I haven't answered in a while, that kind of thing. There are way more questions than, you know, than, than I end up writing down uh, every week. And I thank everyone for participating in this video because without your questions, there isn't a video. Uh, one thing, uh, so this past week I had put up um, from, from last Sunday's video, and a lot of people said Happy Father's Day, thank you. When I was recording that one last week, I didn't, it was like five days before Sunday, and I didn't even remember it was going to be Father's Day when that video went up. So thank you, and Happy Father's Day to everyone else out there um, as, as well. This will be a week after Father's Day. Uh, I, last week I put up um, uh, in, uh, photos of insects and descriptions of them on some, uh, some pests uh, in the garden, um, non-beneficial insects in the garden. And I'm working on the same thing for diseases. So it's you know, photos of disease problems that I have taken over the years and then a brief description of each of them. So it might help you recognize some of the problems that are in your garden. That's on that Learn to Garden video series that I have uh, over on my uh, website uh, that you can purchase. I am going to, you know, there's always a $25 off coupon down below on the videos. I'm actually going to increase that. Uh, there's on this particular video down below, there is a, um, a $50 off um, opportunity here. And I'm going to run that through the 4th of July. If you're interested in the learn to garden video series, it's going to be about 60 hours of video. And there's also a lot of written parts and photo photography as well as part of it. A lot of things that I've collected over the years, I'm making part of that series. Thanks to those. Thanks to those of you who have already purchased it. I really do appreciate it. And let's see, detailed garden tour started this week. So by this point, you will have seen part one, two, and three. If you haven't seen those yet, I'm going through every plant in the garden in, in Raleigh. Uh, I've shot nine, there's nine videos. There's six more coming. So that's how many plants are in that little 0.19 acre lot in Raleigh. It really is a lot of plants. Every video is probably between 25 and 32 minutes ultimately. I am down, um, about to jump into questions, but I'm down here in Loxley, Alabama, doing a little tour of the Gulf, and uh, I'm standing in some sweet starlight hydrangeas. This one's gonna be a new one from the Southern Living Plant Collection. You can see how showy this is, how upright it is. Uh, absolutely looks great. Uh, back in the distance, I don't know if you can see, but there's a lot of Encore Azaleas here uh, reblooming in the summertime. Uh, looks like some autumn bonfire over there. Maybe some, uh, Autumn lilies, uh, I can't tell what else. Autumn starlight, I think, is back there as well. So um, a lot of good looking stuff uh, in a greenhouse down in Loxley, Alabama. All right, let's jump into some questions. Uh, so, so somebody asked, um, just in general, strategies for, not, strategies for not being overwhelmed when you're plant shopping and then buy, jumping in and buying things without a plan. I think a lot of people do this. You just go you want to get something done, you're ready to get it going, and you, don't, you, you haven't really made a plan, and you come home with you know, 10 plants or whatever. You know, spend some money, and then you come home and you're trying to figure out where they're supposed to go. Uh, that's pretty easy to do. I would really start, you know, bed planning is so important. If you go back to the beginning of the videos on the, you know, if you go to the playlist on the channel called New House, okay? So this detailed garden tour series I'm doing is the culmination of three years of videos in that new house playlist. The first few videos are bed planning. And so I, I planned out the spaces that plants were going to go first. I mean, I think that's the, you know, one of the most important things is how are you going to use it? You know, how are you gonna use your property? Do you have young kids? Do you need grass areas for that? Do you have dogs? I mean, all, of, all those kinds of questions have to be answered. And, Part of this is in the Learn to Garden video series too. I've owned some garden planning videos that I'm working on or that are already up or and more are coming on planning. But it's one of those uh, one of those things where I start with the beds first. I know where the beds are going to be. And it doesn't have to be the whole, yard, whole garden. It can just be the front or the side or the back just initially. And then I want to put some of the bones in first. I'd really like to get some evergreen shrubs probably around the perimeter of the house. I probably want to work on my screening plants where I think that I'd want, you know, to some screening, you know, some privacy in the garden. Uh, if I was going to plant a tree, you know, either a shade tree or an ornamental tree, I might jump on that first and really jump in and figure out what, 
flowering tree that you want or you know uh, those kinds of things and jump into that stuff first and then then you can just go have fun uh, you know once you've laid the bone i would call the bones in place you know the of the of the garden plan the beds in place the trees in some of the larger growing shrubs in maybe some stonework patio work all those whatever other items you'd be putting in your garden then you get to jump in and just have fun that's when you can really go shopping and find things that you didn't mean to buy or whatever and then take them home and figure out a place you can move them around the beds so frequently i tell people in consultations you can go so we're going through how to plan this bed and i'm giving a lot of suggestions on plants and then i tell folks at the end you can bring these plants home and move them around the bed in the containers for several days and live with them in the containers above the ground until you hit on the design that you want. And so we do that in the garden in Raleigh. We'll bring something home. That garden is nine videos for 0.19 acres. You know, it's a lot, a lot of plants, right? Uh, but we still bringing things home. I already picked up things on this trip and we'll bring it home and we'll set it in the bed and we'll live with it there for two or three days before we put it in the ground. But start with the bones and I think that will help you to not be absolutely overwhelmed. Okay, so somebody asked about saving F1 hybrid seeds. So they're saving their seeds in their garden, they're saving their flower seeds, vegetable seeds, all those kinds of things, trying to cut down on the cost uh, and you know, saving seeds of something that they really, really liked. And then they had read that you, you, know, you can't necessarily save F1 hybrid seeds. So let me explain what an F1 hybrid is to start with. Okay, so let's say I have a tomato and I really like how the plant grows. Okay, so it's, a, it's an aggressive, it's a fast growing variety. It produces fruit pretty quick, but I'm not 100% satisfied with the actual fruit on it. Okay, so that's one plant over here. Then I got another plant and it produces the best fruit in the world, but the plant itself is somewhat weak. It's just not as vigorous as I would like. And I think if I cross these two together, okay, that I can get a plant that is both vigorous and produces lots of great fruit, okay, lots of great tomatoes. And so what, the way they go about it is they actually isolate these two plants, okay, alone, okay, for a while. And basically, and tomatoes are self-pollinating, self-fruiting. So if I put, if I take this little, take a little bit of greenhouse space in here and then wall it off from everything else and I have that plant, that one tomato plant reproduce its own seed, make seed on it, pollinate itself, okay? And what I do is I do that for several generations. <laughs> this takes a long time, okay? This takes a long time. You, you have to self-pollinate that plant until you get, um, uh, what we call a pure line, okay? So you have, this, this tomato is now a pure line. It's actually cloning itself, okay? Every time it makes a seed, because it's self-pollinated, it's actually virtually a clone of itself, okay? It's not being influenced by any other pollen, from pollen from another plant. Do the same thing with the other one, okay? So you go through several generations until you've created what are called pure lines, and then you take those two plants and you cross them. And that is what an F1 hybrid is. So you're taking two plants that you're 100% sure this is a pure line, this is a pure line. You know, they're basically creating clones of themselves. They haven't been influenced by any other plants anywhere. You take those two and you do a controlled cross on them and you grow that out. That's an F1 hybrid. You grow that out and you see if you're successful, right? Now you still not, you still don't know if you're successful, but this F1 hybrid, uh, you find out, whoa, wow, it is, it is vigorous and it does produce great fruit. So then you release that seed. Seed's kind of expensive. I mean, all those F1 hybrid seeds that we buy for tomatoes, you get like 10 seeds in a pack for <laughs> five bucks or something, $6, very different than the price of other, uh, other tomatoes uh, uh, out there. So this person was like, can I collect the seeds from my F1 hybrids? They do produce seed, but you're likely going to have it potentially crossed with another tomato in your garden, okay? So keep that in mind. It's not likely to be that exact tomato. You know, if you, um, so it, th there's the answer to your question. It's unlikely to be, but it's a lot, but it's likely to have a lot of those attributes that you liked in that tomato. So if you want to save them, save them, but I don't know that you're going to get a clone um, 
from your, unless you were isolating it somehow. But anyway, that's the way F1 hybrids are created. And that's the reason F1 hybrid seeds are very expensive. Tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, whatever it is. Um, but it, it can take years and years to create two pure lines that then you're confident you're crossing and you're going to get, hopefully, the best attributes of the two plants coming together. And if it doesn't come together like that, then you're starting over, right? Okay, uh, so somebody said they, they did like five butterfly bushes from seed in one container. They wanted to know when to divide them. You could divide them now. I might cut them back a little bit. You know, I'd take a third right off the top with a pair of head shears and then I'd divide them. Just don't do it, you know, think through these kinds of things. Don't do it on the driveway, you know, when it's 95 degrees outside in the middle of the day. You know, do it early in the morning or in the evening. Uh, in a shady space and then don't put them back out in the direct sun after you've repotted the individual butterfly bushes and other little containers. You know, don't put them back out in the direct sun maybe for a day. Water them in, let them get settled in for a, a minute um, and you'll be fine. I, you know, any butterfly bush that, will, that you can do from seed is likely one that will also produce seed. So keep in mind, you know, butterfly bushes are invasive in some places. So, um, for us, not really in Raleigh. Um, our cold winters or something is different than it is in the Pacific Northwest where they're wildly invasive. So keep in mind, anyone that you did from seed will produce see, viable seed and could be an issue depending on where you live. Okay, so somebody said, will I direct seed any zinnias this season? No, I, we started all of our zinnias in the house and they're out looking beautiful. Tour video eight or nine. You're gonna to see tons and tons of zinnias out in the front garden. They look absolutely fantastic out there, great. They were looking beautiful before we left. We've gotten a lot of rain since we left Raleigh. All of these tour videos, I'm talking about how dry it is because we shot them right before all the rain came. We left, we left Raleigh and then the rains came. So there you go. So the videos will sound weird, but they have had a lot of rain. Have had a lot of rain there since. Um, but no, I don't direct seed any of, very few of my flowering things. I, I'd rather start them in trays. That's just me. I'm a, maybe I'm a control freak about it. You know, probably my time in the nursery business trying to create clones of everything. I like to start them from seed in the house and then plant, transplant them outside. You can tr easily do zinnias though from seed directly in the ground. They wanted to know if they should cover them in mulch or mulch first and then seed. I wouldn't use any type of like hardwood mulch or anything on them. You could use pine bark maybe, but you're probably best using compost uh, and then scratching, you know, scratching some little, scratch, putting down some compost and then scratching it up a bit with a rake and then seeding into that. Keep in mind that, you know, squirrels and other things like seed as well. So, uh, but you'll get some, zinnias are easy direct seeded like that just you want you may want to you may need to guard them for a few days until they germinate uh, so somebody transplanted a 10 foot tall crepe myrtle it had three trunks uh and now uh in the process every trunk is now doing something different so one is seems to be dead down to the ground and it just has pieces coming right from the bottom of it and one is kind of vigorous with growth up at the top and one's kind of got growth at the top but not so vigorous you know, how to deal with that. I think, unfortunately, that's gonna be a long recovery issue. Um, you know, for me, wow, digging out a 10 foot tall crepe myrtle was not easy, so that's one thing, so kudos. Um, they're, they're not the easiest things to ever dig out of the ground. Uh, I think that you're, you can cut the one completely off and have a two trunk crepe myrtle. That's an option, right? You can rebalance it in the ground and have two trunks and life will be fine with just two trunks. Or you're gonna have to stake one of those suckers from the bottom you know, or pick, just pick the most vigorous one as the season goes on uh, and have it, but it's unlikely to ever catch up with the other two in terms of diameter and it may always look a little strange. So I kind of don't know what to do with that. It depends on your patience, uh, really. The other two trunks, they're alive up at the top, they'll be fine. They're, I'm sure they've gone through some sort of transplant shock and we can't gauge how something grows. We've got another question similar to this. When you dig something, tear something out of the ground and move it, we can't really gauge, you know, that the growth is slow or whatever, and that being ultimately what's going to happen. I'm not worried about that at all. They're alive. The other one sounds like it might be dead. You know, the whole stem might be dead. And you're going to have to be patient and allow one to come up 
you know, one of those suckers. I'd cut all other suckers away once you've decided which one seems to be at the right angle and it seems to be the most vigorous uh, as well. I get a ton of questions from Houston. Houston's such a big city uh, that, you know, and it's such a hard city to kind of garden in because of the heat is so extreme and the amount of rain they actually get over the course of a year or don't get, you know, ma massive amounts of rains or maybe, you know, limited rains. Uh, and it's difficult to garden there. It's again, I've said it in the past and I'll say it again, I would lean on native plants from, you know, Texas native plants if I was down in Houston and then I would go with things that were just, you know, I, I really think the best thing to do down there is to go to public gardens. You have, you have great public gardens in that part of Texas and see what's actually growing well and see what's performing well. You know, lots of these, you know, lots of the plants that you see, you know, in the, in the garden centers, box stores, wherever you're shopping, you know, the, buy the ones that you're seeing, you're actually seeing out in the landscape performing pretty well. And I think you have to be, I think you really have to practice uh, observation if you're in difficult areas. Um, if, you know, whatever that difficulty is, it could be cold, could be hot, could be dry, could be wet, whatever it is, you know, just take a, a study of the area you know, and go to public gardens. I'm not talking about just your neighbors because, you know, that can be very limiting. I mean, we tend to, you know, if I went through my neighborhood and counted all the things people plant in their gardens, we're not going to get a very high number. It's just the same stuff a lot of times over and over and over again. But go to public gardens and you'll see some interesting things maybe that people are overlooking. Sometimes those things might not be at retail and you may have to find them from a specialty place. But I guarantee you there's plenty of things that will take these changeable conditions and heat and uh, humidity and lack of humidity and, and high temperatures and that kind of thing. You know, anything that's held up down there for the last few years as we've had these extremes is definitely something you would want to lean on. Um, I'm sorry, but that's probably the best, my best suggestion. And of course, you know, taking advantage of your um, extension agent down there in that part of Texas is probably a good idea as well. Uh, so somebody is in zone 8B, got a peewee hydrangea, which is a dwarf uh, oak leaf hydrangea and wanted to know where to plant it, said they had clay soils. Um, clay soils are fine with our uh, native uh, oak leaf hydrangeas. In zone 8B, it definitely has to be in the afternoon shade. So morning sun, afternoon shade. In the clay soils, make sure you're mounding everything up just a bit so they don't end up staying too wet. And other than that, it's a native plant. It'll be, it'll be, to it'll be totally fine, but it does need afternoon shade, especially down in 8B. Um, let's see, so somebody, I always get comments that my, my channel, <laughs> my, uh, I'll get called professor or whatever, you know, and, and the nerd, somebody said the nerdy channel, it's a, ner it's a bit, a little bit of a nerdy channel and, and, and it's, that's the reason it's their favorite. Thank you for that. It always will be. I don't think, I don't think just showing you this hydrangea paniculata and then showing you how great it looks in the garden, you know, is beneficial to you as a gardener. I think you need to know what, I think you need some base understanding of why you're being successful or why you're not being successful in your garden. It doesn't do any good for me to be, you know, trying to sell you things, uh, you know, and then it not performing, underperforming, or, you know, sometimes we, we, we want to know why we're being successful and why we're failing, you know, and learning from all of those things. And I think, you know, when it comes down to it, you know, this is all just chemistry, right? The plants are, you know, the, the uh, us, the plants and the soil are all made of, you know, um, things in the periodic table <laughs> and the way those things are arranged, you know, determines a lot about a lot. And so, uh, you know, I do think that uh, we should, you know, we should understand why we're being successful or not and be able to work on improving you know, improving our soils and uh, moving the garden forward. And hopefully out of that, creating less insect problems, less disease problems, less, you know, overall problems. So somebody has got seven Encore Azaleas and they're in the second, um, planted last year. And of course they're not performing up to their, you know, peak potential of what they envision them. There's some beautiful ones again, back here behind me. Uh, this question has nothing to do with Encore Azaleas, really. It's just anything. And I said this about the crepe myrtle earlier. You know, when you take something out of a container and you stick it in the ground, sometimes it'll hit the ground running and sometimes it will hiccup temporarily. Uh, just, you know, fight through that. You know, sometimes I, I always say, though, be careful watering when something has taken a hit. And so be careful 
Um, so, you know, something in a container like one of these hydrangeas that's right here in front of me, while it's blooming like this and while it's putting on this growth, it may need to be watered every day in that container. I put it in the ground and I forget to water it one day and all of a sudden the, the flowers start to fade, it loses a few leaves on the old growth and starts to slow down on me. So then I'm like concerned, what did I do? What did I do? What did I do? And then I start watering it like crazy. And that plant's actually vulnerable to being overwatered when we damage them, okay? And so just the process of putting something in the ground. So be careful not to overwater as a response to a plant being stressed, okay? Make sure you're checking, digging around them, make sure they're actually dry before you water. Cause I've seen that's, that's again, that's when plants become extremely vulnerable to us overthinking it and overdoing it. But typically while they're stressed and they're not putting on a lot of new growth, they're probably not gonna be using a lot of water. I'll just throw that out there. Okay, so somebody asked why people snip off the blooms on coleus. It's a good question. Um, coleus actually have nice flowers and the pollinators absolutely love them. But keep in mind if your coleus is blooming and putting energy into the blooms, it's not putting energy into growing leaves and that's typically what we're growing coleus for the bright burgundy or gold or variegated or multicolored or whatever coleus that you're growing what we do and i've said it in a few videos we let our coleus come to bloom in the late summer so we enjoy our coleus all season there'll be coleus coming up in the uh, uh master tour video that you'll be watching for the next little while uh if you, and thank you for following along with it uh but toward the end of summer, we let our coleus come to bloom. And I'll mention it in another Q&A later this summer. And then we let the pollinators enjoy them and uh, enjoy the flowers ourselves uh, up on top of them. But initially, we do cut them off. We have plenty of other pollinator plants in the garden. And what we want to get as much growth out of the actual foliage part of the plant as we can all summer long and enjoy that. And then that will ultimately uh, allow us to end up with more flowers at the end of summer anyway, if the plant's bigger. Uh, Okay, so somebody um, asked about viburnum being stinky. So viburnum is a big genus. There's a lot of different species of viburnum. Just in our garden, uh, we have viburnum davidi and um, uh, what other viburnum? I'm not gonna think of, uh, I have viburnum obovatum. I have viburnum nudum. I have viburnum placatum. Uh, these are all different species of viburnums, okay? And there's lots of them. Dentatum is another great uh, native viburnum. There are lots of native and non-native viburnums. They were asking about the stinkiness of them. Some of them are, uh, do have kind of um, putrid, uh, kind of smelling flowers. If you look at the, the viburnum with the long corollas or the deeper, uh, slightly deeper flowers tend to have a sweeter smell and don't smell funky. Um, those are the ones that the um, Lepidoptera Lepidoptera or um, uh, butterflies are pollinated. Okay, they, you know, that, those are the ones that the butterflies pollinate, are the ones with the deeper corollas. The ones with the shallow corollas are the ones that tend to have kind of a little bit of a putrid smell, almost so sweet that they stink. Those are, were probably pollinated by flies or small bees or something like that. So keep in mind that where the plant ev you know, evolved in the world you know, as it separated and became speciated from one another. You know, these viburnum get separated and then they, they become different over a long period of time. It's whatever was available for them to, you know, pollinate is what they were trying to attract. So yes, yeah, some of them are stinky and some of them, they smell great. Uh, and it's, it is kind of interesting. Uh, they all have a smell. <laughs> Good, bad, or ugly. Let's see. Uh, so, so somebody just said what to do about fall blooming plants that are flowering early. There's a lot of it and nothing you can do really. My uh, several things in our garden, uh, shrubs and uh, perennials that are typically fall blooming are blooming now. I'm hoping that they'll just carry some flowers into fall as well. So Saladago is blooming. Um, not gonna think of anything else right here off the top of my head. Uh, I've got, uh, uh, fall blooming asters that have already thrown a few flowers out that kind of thing so but i'm hoping they'll continue to flower because this person's also said that these plants are very important to fall pollinators and they absolutely are uh, but there are a lot of flowers in the a lot of native flowers in the fall those um there's so many yellow flowering asters in the fall they're actually hard to identify i spend every fall hiking somewhere 
trying to identify all the yellow flowering perennials that go off from about you know mid-August up through October down here in the south and there's just uh, there's a lot of them. Then I got a really interesting one. Somebody uh, said, uh, do I know Bryce Lane, who was a, prof he's a professor from NC State, retired professor from NC State, and that he put up a tour video of his garden a few years ago and that I should, go, you know, I should try to get up with him and do a tour video. And it was the funniest question because I was with Bryce last weekend at that plant symposium I was at last weekend. Bryce was there. We talked for a while and, uh, and we, we, we had talked in the past about filming his garden and then it just didn't follow through on it. And, you know, for whatever reason, the world's been weird the last three years, but I am in a few weeks going to Bryce's and filming. Uh, Steph, uh, Stephanie actually had a class with Bryce when he was, uh, when he was a prof um, full-time professor at NC State. So, uh, yes, do know him. Uh, super, super nice gentleman. You guys will love that tour and, and love him. He's just one of the best, um, just one of the best people. Let's see. Um, so somebody asked, this is a good question about planting close, uh, to use less mulch. So planting your plants pretty close. Like I talk about all the time for one, I'm all, I'm, I talk about using less mulch, but more than anything, I'm actually trying to shade the roots of the plants too. Plants just grow better when their roots are shaded by their neighbors. And so that is much, as much for me as anything, but okay. So planting close to use less mulch or have the things shade their roots versus disease issues that could result from not having good air movement around those plants. That's a balancing act you have to play, right? So if you have a uh, bee balm or Monarda that's getting, uh, that's getting powdery mildew or you have some sort of issues cropping up like that, then remove the things around those or plant those in spaces where the air will move around them a bit. If you watched one of my videos on my channel and I said this plant needs good air movement and there are a few of those, then you know, that may be something you don't crowd as much as others, but just gauge it based on what's happening in your garden. Uh, again, the more species you have in your garden, whether that's, you know, birds and all those kinds of things down to the plants and the ground covers and everything, all of those things work together to create a happy, you know, healthy environment. Occasionally we can probably overdo <laughs> and end up with issues, but just monitor those things and you can, you can just move something. If it's a perennial that's getting some sort of leaf spot issue or powdery mildew, just pop it out of the ground, try it at another spot and see if that uh, helps with it. A lot of times those things don't matter that much anyway. I've got powdery mildew on both of my bee bombs at the house a little bit and they're blooming like crazy. The bees are all over them and I just don't worry about it. I actually, most of the powdery mildew is down in the bottom of it and I can't see it because there's something in front of it anyway. So somebody asked when to root a uh, cornice elliptica or that evergreen dogwood that I have at the house anytime here in the summertime. I, that would be my answer to almost every propagation question you guys could ask. The best time is almost always in the early summer right now. Uh, that's when we did, I would say 80% of the rooting I did at my nursery. It was also helpful because we'd have the spring shipping season and spring potting season and you're busy, 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 busy. And then you hit about June 15th and we'd stick cuttings for two months. And it was kind of the ideal time to do it while it's hot and while the plants are growing, kind of the ideal time to root most things. So somebody asked if they should give up on a maple tree that's dying slowly, probably. You know, they've got a red maple that was, you know, see this all over the city. My neighbor has one that's dying in the garden next to us. The one at the house was dying uh, and uh, it's the reason it came out. So it's just like a slow death of one branch falls off and then another branch, you know, just a slow, steady death. Yeah, I think I would probably, um, I, I don't know. I haven't seen it. I'm answering a question. I haven't seen the tree, but in all likelihood, if it fits the description of almost every red maple I see in an urban environment in a small lot, yes, it's probably has a short, uh, short life coming. Uh, so somebody asked how much a fatsia should grow in a season. And again, this was another question based on they had planted one and it hasn't grown all that much. Well, that's you know always going to be the case that things pick up pace. I mean, if I told you green giant arborvita grow three to four feet a year, not in the first year. I mean, in the first year, it's going to grow a little bit, maybe. Sometimes it won't grow at all, but it's going to grow some. For other people, it might grow a little more, right? It depends. I mean, some things hit the ground running, but by the third or fourth year is when the engine really picks up on fast growing things. So fatty are actually put on a pretty good amount of growth in a single season, but it may not in the first year or two. 
uh, and then it will pick up some pace. There are fatsia on NC State's campus that are you know, eight by eight, 10 by 10. I've seen them bigger than that. Um, but it will pick up pace probably slowly. Like my spider's web fatsia that's in the third tour video should have been the one you saw yesterday. Didn't grow at all for a year and a half. And part of it was when I stunted it by planting it at the wrong time. But this year it's doubled in height uh, in its second or third spring. I can't remember actually. Okay, so somebody asked if Vitex can be cut to the ground. It was broken off uh, in a storm. It was leaning and doing stuff and they, you know, it ended up cracking completely at some point up here. Can it be cut to the ground? Yeah, in all likelihood, if you have one that's been in the ground for a long time. I think what will happen is you're going to get suckers based on the damage that was done to the top of it. And so if you're nervous about it, you can wait for a couple of those suckers to form down at the bottom. And once you see that growth down at the bottom, then you can go ahead and cut it off, if that makes sense. Because it's definitely going to sucker now that it's been damaged up at the top. So if you want to wait and you're nervous, wait for some suckers and then cut it. Okay, so somebody asked about planting around mature crepe myrtles and then somebody else said they are greedy. Uh, they're, they're difficult when you have one that's been in the ground for a long time. They have a little bit of a fibrous root system around them, similar to maples. They can be a bit hard to garden around, but if you're putting in things that you know are okay for dry shade or drier conditions, definitely drought tolerant things, you can plant around them. You may wanna get smaller containers because it may be difficult to dig a big container in around one. And then you're going to have to water it longer than you normally would. So where if you were planting something in an open bed in a new space, you might have to water it uh, you know, whatever, every third day or every week or something. This you're gonna to wanna to check on nearly daily for some period of time. And instead of it, it being weaned off the water after a year, like you might normally do, it might take a couple years of monitoring it before it can get its footing under it to compete with that crepe myrtle. Okay, so um, last question for this week. And again, I appreciate everybody's participation in this video. Ask gardening questions down below and I'll have another one of these up next week. So somebody asked about digging out an old damaged uh, camellia and how hard it was going to be. I, it just depend, It honestly depends on how big it is and how, you know, how long it's been in the ground. Uh, they, can, they can end up with a fairly heavy root system. So it's gonna take a little bit of effort, but keep in mind, you don't have to do everything all at once. You, know, you can go out there and dig on it a little bit, take a break from it. You know, hit it again the next week. You know, you can use a sawzall in there and help cut some of the roots out. And maybe make some, you know, make maybe make some of the effort a little bit easier. I transplanted an old camellia in a video on the channel, not that long. Ago, you know, what was that? At the old house, it was maybe four years ago now when that video would have gone up. If you want to go back and take a look at that video, that was just transplanting one, but you can see, you know, the, the root system looked like, like on it, um, you know, in that video, but. Again, I don't think you'll have that big of a problem getting it out of the ground, but always with any of these jobs, with any of these things people ask, not everything has to be done in one day, okay? You can, all of these things can be done over some period of time. You don't have to, you don't have to get to the finish line, you know, in six months, you know, when you move into a new place or you start a new project, you can take a long time to do it and maybe enjoy the process a little more along the way. So thank you guys for, watching, following along with the channel. There'll be more of the Master Gardener, Master Garden Tour videos up this week. And then we're down here in Loxley. We've got shooting a couple other videos as well. We'll start to, I'm gonna to start to mix a few into the uh, Garden Tour videos. Thanks for watching.